As you can see in your uh, bulletin or order of worship, we are in the sermon series Heart to Heart Talks. And it is discussions that people are having with Jesus. And today's title is Hush Hush. In our Lenten Bible study last Sunday, or last Wednesday rather, I posed this question. When have you experienced going out on a limb for God? The gathered group was regaled with the story of a group of church women, our church women, who, guided by Heather Jarrell, the previous pastor's wife, decided to hold a clothing swap. They collected used clothing, lugged it all over to Dow Park, set it up among the playground structures, and served only eight people to their grave disappointment. However, when we dug deeper into that story, the seed planted by their action became Gigi's closet. And Irma told you they served 20 people last two weeks ago. The numbers of people served by this outreach continues to grow as word gets out about it. Now, why do I bring up this question and story, you might wonder? Well, Nicodemus puts himself out there. He goes out on a limb. Sure, he's not as open with his risk-taking as were our intrepid group of church women. He's not standing out in the middle of the day. No, Nicodemus searches Jesus out in the darkness of the lockdown night of Jerusalem. To reveal to his colleagues that he was seeking Jesus would have been a pretty risky move for him. Yet he does reveal that he and the religious authorities believe Jesus is a religious teacher sent by God. So there is at least that. But he wants to have this conversation in private, away from prying eyes. Now, this is the first of three encounters uh, Nicodemus will have with Jesus in the three years of Jesus' ministry. We will find him again in uh, chapter 7, uh, verses 50 to 51. And this time, it is Jesus, actually, who is sneaking around in secret at the Festival of Booths. Jesus is well aware of the treachery set upon his life at that time. He knows the Pharisees are looking for him, and they want to put him to death. Eventually, Jesus brings himself to the temple during the festival of booths and begins to teach. Now, here's the answer to a question that came up at our study on Wednesday. How did Jesus know about the law? After all, he is human, so did he study it, like all other humans? Verses 15 and 16 of John's chapter 7 explains, Astonished, the Jewish leaders asked, He's never been taught. How has he mastered the law? And Jesus responded, My teaching isn't mine, but comes from the one who sent me. And then, and then Jesus openly asks them, why do you want to kill me? Can you imagine asking that question? Why are you angry with me because I made an entire man well on the Sabbath? And then he says, don't judge according to appearances. Now, I find Jesus' admonishment, don't judge according to appearances, pretty intriguing. Here we have Jesus appearing at the temple after secretly heading up to Jerusalem without even his brother's knowledge, brothers plural. And we have Nicodemus turning up in John's gospel as early as chapter 3. This time, Nicodemus, in our reading, stands fully, oh, uh, this time, never mind my, my little side, um, 
as early as chapter 3. But this time, Nicodemus, in chapter 7, stands fully in the presence of his colleagues, the Pharisees, and poses a challenge to them. We read, Nicodemus, who was one of them and had come to Jesus earlier, said, Our law doesn't judge someone without first hearing him and learning what he is doing, does it? So the gospel refers back to our reading when Nicodemus had come to find Jesus in the cover of darkness. And the next time we will encounter Nicodemus is way in chapter 19 at Jesus' burial. And it says, After this, Joseph of Arimathea asked Pilate if he could take away the body of Jesus. Joseph was a disciple of Jesus, but a secret one, because he feared the Jewish authorities. Pilate gave him permission, so he came and took the body away. Nicodemus, the one who at first had come to Jesus at night, was there too. He brought a mixture of myrrh and aloe, nearly, nearly 75 pounds in all. Now it was Joseph of Arimathea who is named a secret disciple. However, Nicodemus was there having carried 75 pounds of an embalming mixture. Do you think he was noticed? Do you think, unlike Joseph of Arimathea, that Nicodemus has been moved to boldness, to going out on a limb for Jesus? Now, not that I think Joseph was a coward. He did put himself out there with Pilate, the Roman governor, to claim Jesus' body. His fear was of the religious authorities, imagine that, not the Roman ones. And as we approach Easter, we can see clearly why he was fearful. It wasn't as though Joseph's fears were unfounded, were they? He was burying his Messiah. All right. Now let us turn to Abram. Remember, Abraham didn't become Abraham until after God promised, actually covenanted with him, to make him the father of a multitude, which is what Abraham means in Hebrew. And to put it mildly, Abram went out on a limb for God. Here's how God calls to him. We go to uh, 12, chapter 12 of Genesis. The Lord said to Abram, Leave your land, your family, and your father's household for the land that I will show you. He doesn't even know where he's going. I will make of you a great na nation and bless you. I will make your name respected, and you will be a blessing. Abram left just as the Lord told him, and Lot went with him. Now Abram was 75 years old when he left Haran. Abram took his wife Sarai, his nephew Lot, all of their possessions, and those who became members of their household in Haran. And they set out for the land of Canaan. Unlike Jesus, Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea, there is no need for secrecy in this story. In the story of Abram, he just brings everybody together and away they caravan. And Noah and his family, as was Adam, were given the command to be fertile and multiply. Theirs too was a covenant with God that never again would the earth be destroyed by God's own hand. And there was a sign given here, a rainbow in the sky. For Abram, it was the stars in the sky representing the multitude of his offspring, now in this conversation that Jesus is having with Nicodemus that we read today, Jesus says, if I have told you about earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? 
Now Jesus is in trouble with the religious authorities because he had healed a sick man on the Sabbath. And this was called a sign by the people. They asked, when the Messiah comes, will he do more signs than this man, Jesus, has done? So we're going to talk a little about signs in the story of Jesus. Upon Jesus' birth, the shepherds are given a sign. In that region, there were shepherds living in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. Then an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for see, I am bringing you good news of great joy for all the people. To you is born, to you is born this day in the city of David, a Savior who is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find a child wrapped in bands of cloth and lying in a manger. So the Old Testament signs that we've been reading about illustrate God's relationship with us and to us. The New Testament signs point the way to God among us. Do you see that difference? And who's among us? The Messiah. Jesus is known through these signs, his healing and his teaching. These are the ways the Messiah becomes revealed to us. As he says to Nicodemus, God walking among the throngs of people at the festival of booths in Jerusalem. God preaching in the temple. Can we even imagine that people literally, literally rubbed and bumped elbows with God? The wonder of it caught me up while I was writing this sermon. But as we can hear further along in chapter 7... Jesus becomes completely frustrated as he has definitely placed himself himself in a risky encounter in the temple and still there is doubt about his identity. Then Jesus cried out at his, as he was teaching in the temple, you know me and you know where I am from. I have not come on my own. But the one who sent me is true, and you do not know him. I know him because I am from him, and he sent me. End of quote. It was not hard for me to read this passage, obviously, with emotion. His frustration is palpable in these words. I am showing myself fully to you, and yet you still not, do not believe? Jesus risks everything. Now we can see a spiritual progression, an awakening, if you will, with Nicodemus. From his skulking around in the night air in search of Jesus, to standing up for him with the Pharisees, and then finding him at the tomb. There are signs of Nicodemus' growth in belief. He no longer stands in the shadows searching for Jesus. He stands literally between the Word, with a capital W, the actual Word in the flesh, and the law that Moses brought. He holds fast to the law that does not judge without a hearing, remember? Nicodemus follows Jesus' admonition, don't judge according to appearances. He stands firmly in this liminal space that the Gospel of John offers us this morning, the space that is both here and yet to come. From the story I told at the beginning of this sermon, 
we can mine out the meaning that showing up is important. Even if the mission seemed as though it failed. If we had been in the dusty streets of Jerusalem, spying Nicodemus as he nervously made his way, glancing over his shoulder, moving quickly and stealthily among the shadows, would we have thought he would hold such an esteemed place in the story of Jesus? We have to hold fast to Jesus' words. Don't judge according to appearances. Going out on a limb is messy, and we risk looking foolish. And uh, this is a word we've heard a lot about in my sermons these last months. I know. And I can hear it in their voices too. Those women who carted all of those clothes out to Dow Park, ah, they feel a little foolish in their hope and their exuberance. Mm -hmm. Nicodemus risked being throw thrown out of his religious community, which was his livelihood. Abram left his home in Ur. Jesus left his family. His own brothers, we discover earlier, didn't even believe in the Messiah. And quote, it says in verse 5, for not even his brothers believed in him. Going out on a limb isn't comfortable for everyone, especially not the Messiah. So when you get heckled, or people don't believe in your vision, you'll know you're in divine company. Ask the folks who volunteer at Gigi's Closet or those who give their time to offer meals for a memorial service or any number of ways people volunteer without visibly receiving in return. Going out on a limb for someone other than yourself, especially a stranger, comes with its discomforts, but it is always well worth the price. If you need a yardstick to know whether, like Nicodemus, you're standing on the right side of the law, look to Jesus. And I quote, anyone who resolves to do the will of God will know whether the teaching is from God or whether I am speaking on my own. Those who speak on their own seek their own glory but the one who seeks the glory of him who sent him is true, and there is nothing false in him. Amen. <clears throat>